Hey there, Python trainer Ruven Lerner here. And this time I want to talk to you about identifiers. Now, identifiers are not like, it's not a word that rolls off the tongue, identifiers. But what identifiers are is variable names and function names and class names. Basically, anything we give a name to in Python that the system doesn't come with. So there are rules and conventions regarding these identifier names, and it's important to know what these are if and when you are going to be, well, writing your own Python code. And I was recently asked by a few people what these rules and conventions are. Now, I'm not making any of this up myself. All of this is in PEP8. PEP8 is the style guide for Python, and you can look it up under PEP8. You can see here it says, uh, you know, Python style guide for Python code. And if we look here, you'll see down below naming styles, right? And naming styles will talk about uppercase, lowercase, underscores. We're going to talk about all that here. But just so you know, again, I haven't made any of this up, and I'm hoping I don't get any of it wrong. So the first and most important thing is that Python identifiers are case sensitive. So if I say x equals 100, I can then say print. Yes, you know, x equals x. And sure enough, that works great. And I can say x times 10, and that works great also. But what a lot of people don't realize is that if I say capital X times 10, Python is going to give me an error. It's going to say name error. The name X is not defined. And of course, it's saying that the name capital X is not defined, whereas lowercase is defined just fine. And that's because identifiers are case sensitive. It does make a difference whether you use uppercase or lowercase letters. And I see people make this mistake, especially if they're new to programming and new to Python. I see them make this mistake all the time. So stick with lowercase. The rule is generally in Python that we should be using lowercase letters for our identifiers. But that's not quite precise enough, right? It's true that we're going to use lowercase letters. But what constitutes a letter? I know that sounds kind of crazy, right? Well, we typically are going to use lowercase letters A through Z plus underscore. Underscore is considered to be a letter in many programming languages. Now, why would I do that? That's because I might want to have a multi-word identifier, either variable or function name. And so to connect the words, I'm going to use underscores because you can't have spaces in there, right? So I could say your first name equals Ruben and last name equals learner. And that works just fine. And I can say print, you know, let's say first name and last name. And using underscores in this way is a pretty typical way to have multi-word identifiers. Um, it looks a little weird when you're starting to program, but after a while you get used to it. Um, now I should add also that this is known sometimes as snake case. Snake case because it stays low to the ground. I promise you I did not make that up. And so the standard for most identifiers in Python is going to be snake case. This is not to be confused with camel case, where camel case, as you can see, it's sort of like a camel goes up and down and up and down with a hump. Again, I'm not making this up. And camel case is actually the standard in many, many programming languages for function names, for variable names. In Python, though, there is one place where we want to use camel case, and that's going to be for class names. So again, everything in Python is going to be snake case, except for class names, which are going to be camel case. So if I say here, right, you know, class, um, let's say multinational corporation, right, I'll just do a pass here. So that's a pretty standard way to describe a class because it's going to be in camel case. Now, you don't have to use quite as many capital letters there as I just did. Right? Maybe N shouldn't be capitalized, but this is a style you'll see. And so it's typical then to use camel case, and then you can readily identify what is a class versus what is a function or just a regular old variable. Um, I should add, by the way, that Python itself does not stick to these rules. So, right, what's the type of A, B, C, D? Stir. What is stir? That's right, it's a class. But even something that we can bring in from another module, so I say from collections, import default dict, right? What's the type of default dict? That's going to be a type, which means it's a class as well. So why does Python violate its own rules or its own conventions? Stir is lowercase, default dict is lowercase. Why are these not in camel case? Um, tradition, history, there's just a long, long uh, line of, or I say a long tradition of having these names be lowercase in Python. You can sometimes date when something joined Python, when something was added to Python, by whether it follows this convention or not. But it's pretty rare 
other than the core data structures to have something that's lowercase that's also a class. So camel case for classes, snake case for everything else. So all that's fine and everything, but underscores actually can sort of come back, I don't know if to haunt us is the right word, but underscores can be used kind of specially. So for example, um, most, well, everything in Python is public, is open, is readable. So if I want to, I can say, you know, x equals 100 and y equals 10, 20, 30, and z equals a1, b2, c3. And there's no way for me to stop anyone else inside of my Python program from seeing these or from printing them out. The whole notion of private or protected variables doesn't exist. And this is not just true for variables, it's true for methods and it's true for attributes on our objects. People coming from other languages like C-sharp and Java are often surprised to discover that there's no way to say that a certain attribute, what they would call a field or an instance variable, is private. But it does not exist in Python. Everyone can basically read everything from anywhere whenever they want. Um, and no, it does not lead to the chaos that many Java and C-sharp programmers think it will, but it does require a bit more discipline. But what if you do have some information that's kind of secret, private? You, what you can do is you can flag to other people that it's private by putting an underscore before the name. So if I say here, for example, class person, so I'm going to say def in it. We'll get back to the dunder in just a moment. Self first and second. I'm going to say here, self first equals first and self second equals second. So both first and second are attributes on this individual object here. And they are totally public because everything is public. And then I can say here like self.password. Watch this. I'll add another one here, password. And I can say self.password equals password. Well, you probably don't want to have the password around in such an easy to read way, right? By the way, you should never be storing passwords in clear text, but that's a separate issue. But what I can do is try to sort of discourage people from looking at it by saying self underscore password. And now we know that, you know, password is private. Now, is it really private? No, this is 100% a convention. So you can use underscore to indicate that something is private, that something should be semi-secret. Um, it's even more common, I would say, to have a, a underscore at the beginning of a name when you might be changing in the future. The API is not necessarily stable. It's internal information that other people should not be accessing, right? Password's a bit of an exaggerated case here. What if you are um, presenting an API to the outside world and your internal representation might be changing over the next few versions or you don't want people messing with how it's done internally? Then what you can do is you can use an underscore at the beginning and the underscore at the beginning ensures that people know, hey, if you touch this, things might break. You should not be doing that. So it's like a warning to people. All right, so that's if you have an underscore at the beginning. You can also, though, have two underscores. What I can do is I can say class employee and def under in it of self. Let's do this. We're just going to inherit that. Class employee inherits from person. And in it, it's itself first, second, password, and employee ID. And what I can do is then do a super of in it. And then I'll say here first second password so that'll be passed along and then i can say here self dot uh, employee id equals employee id nothing wrong or tricky with what i've done here but what if i'm a little nervous that my attribute employee id might get stepped on or might conflict with something either in a class from which i inherit which is not the case here or from a future class that will inherit from me what if i want to make sure that this employee id stays sort of uh, loyal to me, as it were, just like employees should stay loyal, right? Well, what I can do is I can actually put two underscores in front of it. Well, how is that going to help things? Now I can say equals employee. I can say new employee, and we're going to say, you know, first name, let's just say F, and uh, I guess it's not going to be second, right? Well, fine, we'll say, you know, S, and then we'll say PW, and I'm going to say one, two, three. And so now if I say, hey, what's E dot first and E dot second, right? That all works fine, and E dot password right? Oops, don't have a password there. So I have to get from underscore password because it's so secret. But what about that employee ID? If I say e dot employee ID, it's actually not going to work. Why not? Because we have this double underscore here. Okay, well, I can do that. I can say e dot double underscore employee ID, right? No, that doesn't exist either. Okay, now things are getting weird, right? Like, how can it be that double underscore employee doesn't exist when I just created it? Oh, well, actually, I misspelled it there. Uh -huh. 
it still doesn't exist. <laughs> and the reason is if we do a vars on E, look at what we have here. We have first, we have second, we have under password, and we have under employee, under under employee ID. This is known as name mangling. And name mangling means if the attributes name starts with double underscore, it will be replaced by thunder or you know one underscore and then class and then two underscores and then the rest of the name right so the double underscore there at the beginning is replaced by underscore and then the class now why would python do this because in this way then if we are inheriting from that class we are guaranteed not to conflict with its attribute so it's still accessible you can still do it i can still say a e dot under employee under under employee id and i get that and it works just fine but now if someone else if some subclass decides to define employee id it's not going to cause trouble well we saw already now twice that i have to define dunder in it if i want well i don't have to define it at the beginning of my class but i often want to so dunder in it and you can hear from the way that i'm calling it so dunder is a python way of saying double underscore before and after the name so dunder in it becomes under under in it under under and you know dunder i don't know stir becomes under under stir under under and so on and so forth uh, the first time that i heard dunder mentioned out loud uh was when i was watching a talk on youtube a number of years ago and i was sure that the person had pronounced it wrong or that i was hearing things wrong no no this is actually a standard way to describe things in python you can define whatever you want with these dunders but don't don't do that and I just want to, the, the reason is basically that Dunder says, I am now writing something that Python is going to expect with a special name, typically, but not only, magic methods, meaning methods that will allow us to do operator overloading. And so when you define a Dunder method, you're saying, I want to hook into this API that Python has a certain expectation will work in a certain way. And so if you just go willy-nilly defining dunders, it's going to look weird. People aren't going to understand. And you might accidentally end up defining something that you did not expect and changing the behavior of your object. So you should really only use dunders when you really know what the name is and what it's expected to do. Otherwise, you could end up with all sorts of really weird problems. All right. So we've got under, one underscore at the beginning. We've got two underscores at the beginning with the name mangling. We've got dunder, two underscores at the beginning and the end. We also have two other uses for underscore. One of them is, um, so if I say here, for example, uh, def, uh, you know, get class name string. This is a really silly sort of example. And I say here, C. I can say here, return C dot under name. So now I say, so I get class name of stir. It's going to return stir as a string. Okay, so far so good. But maybe I want to have an, uh, a variable name here that's not just C. Maybe I want to have a name that's a little longer than that. So I could say, oh, I'll just call it class, right? That's pretty obvious. It'll be really readable and understandable. There's only one problem, which is that class is a reserved word. So you cannot use it as a variable. But what I can do is say class underscore. And if I do that, my meaning is obvious. And the underscore ensures that's a different name and thus does not conflict. Now it'll work just fine. And now I can say get class name string of stir. And it'll work. Well, actually, it doesn't work just fine here because I have to say class underscore. But other than that, it works just great. There we go. I should add, by the way, that in the machine learning library, scikit-learn, the underscore after the name is actually used on attributes to indicate stuff that has been set during the training of a model. So you can get all sorts of interesting information back from a model by looking at attributes with a name underscore. Okay, finally, in terms of the underscores, we also have just plain old underscore, just that. What the heck is underscore? So this is like the, the junk drawer in your kitchen if you have something like that. This is the variable that gets all sorts of default values that is automatically set and reset and that we can also set. It's basically, where do you store things if you don't care about them? So for example, if I say here, my list equals 10, 20, 30, and I want to say here, first, middle, end equals my list. Well, this using tuple unpacking will indeed work just fine. And first will be 10, and middle will be 20, and end will be 30. What if I only care about first and end, and I don't care about the middle? So what I can do is I can say first underscore end equals my list. And underscore will then get the value of 20. 
This is a, a typical sort of case when we don't care about what's assigned there. I'm just going to like assign it, give it a variable name. I don't want to use up another variable and maybe make my code uh, less readable. I personally don't tend to use underscore very much for throwaway values, but sometimes, sometimes it can actually be useful. Um, but basically, underscore by itself means don't expect to get this value back. You're assigning it because you have to assign it, not because you want to use it for anything else. One last thing uh, to sum up all this about identifiers. What if I say here, right, uh, max value equals 100? Max value here is a perfectly reasonable identifier, or I could say max value, and sure enough, that comes back as 100. As far as Python's concerned, it's just another identifier, just another variable. It's, it's referring to just another in, uh, integer. That's fine. That works well. But we call this in the Python world a constant. Right, so meaning it should now, now does Python care? No, Python does not see constants as any different from anything else. Maybe some code checkers will see it as different, but like, you know, PyLint or PyFlakes will see it as different. But we, but Python, the language doesn't see it as different. We, however, as humans are supposed to see this and say, aha, this is a value that's not supposed to be overwritten. But Python, again, if I say max value equals 200, there we go, I've changed the value. Now max value is gonna be 200, you know, nothing has changed. So if I want to have a constant, which basically means a value that I want to set once and then use a bunch of times, I can do that. Nothing wrong with that. Just realize that's a convention rather than any sort of uh, thing that the language is going to stop us from changing. Okay, that covers our different kinds of uh, uh, identifiers, variable names, function names, method names, class names in Python. I hope that you enjoyed this and learned from it. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You get me on Twitter, you get me via email. I love getting questions from people and I hope to see you soon in another video.